Hi, and welcome to Thank Good It's Friday, brought to you by Kono Wines. I'm Carolyn Enting, editor of Good Magazine, and today's topic is home, and we're talking about sustainable homes in particular. We have some fantastic guests here with us today. We have the executive director and founder of Solar City, Andrew Booth. Hi, Andrew. Hi, nice to see you. Great to have you here. We have Kate Hall from Ethically Kate blog. I'm sure you all know her. Hi, Kate. Hello. And we have our fantastic Good Magazine um, commercial manager, Justine Jamison. Hi, Justine. Hi. Now, the idea behind these Thank Good It's Friday um, get-togethers is just to support local business and also to come together over a Friday afternoon drink. Um, and today we're drinking a lovely uh, Pinot Noir from Marlborough from um, Conno Wine. So thank you, Conno. And we also have some fantastic prizes to give away today. Uh, we have four $100 vouchers from Wallace Cotton, which is one of my favourite um, ethical homeware brands. They use a lot of organic cotton and linen. Um, they don't use plastic packaging at all. They are really ethical, so great prize. And Conno Wines is also giving away one $50 restaurant voucher. So if you want to go be in to win, go to good.net.nz competitions and you can go on the draw for that. And congratulations to our winners from last week who've each won a $100 um, Greenlee voucher. So it's fantastic talking about home because I know a lot of us have actually spent a lot of time at home lately. <laughs> <laughs> and it's also... I guess this whole lockdown experience has made us think about things differently as well and how we can do things differently. Um, and Andrew, I thought I'd, I'd start with you um, because, you know, solar is something that we can do differently. And I know you obviously are a big fan of solar. Um, can you tell us why it's just such a great thing? I think the main thing that struck me around um, the lockdown really was, was um, I mean, there were lots of sunny days, right? And a lot of us were stuck inside. But you realise when you look at the numbers that enough solar power falls on the planet every hour to power everything we do around the planet for a year. And so you start to look at um, all that resource that we're just giving away every day and we're not capturing and you start to wonder why. And I think many people stopped to wonder why during this lockdown period. And I think the main thing to take away from it for me is that is that really not embracing and, and capturing that power when solar power has become so cheap now is a, is a waste of resource, but also a waste of an opportunity to live in a much more sustainable way. Do you see, yeah, Andrew, do you see solar power as the way of the future rather than any other power? Do you see? Yeah, I think that um, I think many people internationally now, all the major analysts now believe that solar power will be um, the primary power for most of um, the, the Earth's sort of energy requirements. Even the chief executive Shell recently said it will unquestionably be the number one globally. And that's purely because it's so ubiquitous and and uh, and such an incredible source of power. I think the main challenge has been storage, um, with battery storage costs coming down quite dramatically now year on year, and with the rise of EVs, that will simply accelerate more and more. The ability to store that power so you can use it when the sun's not shining will be the key tipping point, I think, for most economies and for most people. And that's already here in New Zealand and increasingly in every single economy over the next two to three years. So I think it will become the dominant way. You'll always have a role for wind and for hydro in terms of balancing that out across a year. Um, obviously the sun shines more in the summer than the winter and the winter is when hydro and, and wind really kicks in. So that combination of renewables with battery storage will most, most certainly be in the next two to three years the way in which most of the world is powered. Quite a dramatic transformation quite quickly, I think, we'll mm. start to see now. I was watching this. Um, I went down one of those rabbit holes that you go down on Facebook, <laughs> social media. Um, and I found myself now Facebook's just delivering these all these solar-powered cars to me with, with the, oh, yeah. like really high-end, um, all the bodies of the cars are all now gathering all the solar power and charging their batteries as they're going. Do yeah. you see, so what, what sort of product development um, are you seeing with within your business is it moving really fast or yeah it's moving incredibly quickly and a lot of it is around being able to use silicon in much sort of smaller quantities ultra thin silicon now to create flexible silicon which can be used on the outside of vehicles and the outside of buildings and i think you'll see a lot of those embedded uh, uses of the technology over time in clothing 
and in household appliances, which will improve efficiency at, of, of how energy is used um, and um, generated in the home. One of the key things about solar, which people f often forget, is that it allows you to generate power locally in your own home, which is 25% more efficient than using it from the grid, right? Because you're not transporting it over huge distances. Because as everyone knows, which I always found odd when I started in the energy business, uh, electricity leaks out of all the wires as it's being transported. So in reality, uh, it's super important and way more efficient to generate power locally um, as it is to sort of live and shop locally. Um, the same thing applies to energy. If you can use it and generate it locally, way more efficient and better for the environment. They used the example of um, solar power on that documentary 2040, which you've probably <laughs> seen. Erin's probably, I love that. That really, really left a, a mark. Yeah. That was one particular takeaways. It was awesome. Yeah, but Kate, you're going to sustainable sustainable cities conference. Is that next week? Yeah, it starts next week. Um, there are three weeks of of information. Um, I've never been to it, and um, yeah, I'm really excited. I'm not sure. Obviously, you see a, a lineup of different keynote speakers, um, but it'll be yeah interesting to see kind of where they foresee, um, you know. Where, where are we going to go, what things they're going to focus on and what they think are the key aspects that need to need to happen. But um, it's a good reminder, actually, I think in this eco space, we can get caught up in the desirable lifestyle block. And, the, you know, I, I personally, that's, you know, a personal dream that you can fantasize about. But reality is where most of us are going to be in cities already, you know, like 55 percent of us um, of the world lives in a city and that all that's just continuing to grow. Um, so I think it's going to be, yeah, really important to hear about um, how we can build cities sustainably, um, sustainably not just for the environment, but for people and for strong communities and, and for everyone. Um, so, yeah, I'm really, really um, excited. It's about two and a half hours every week um, and you can, there's break off groups and um, you can ask lots of questions. So, uh, yeah, that's going to be awesome. I think really key for um, sustain like city planners and sustainability consultants that's probably going to be um yeah the main main people will be able to chat to and throw ideas around i'm sure that's solar great. will be in there well hopefully we'll, we, we should get you to write a report on the conference afterwards for good yeah. well um, i totally i'll be writing i'm yeah. sure you will uh, <laughs> stuff on, on my blog and, and online because um i think it's just so crucial we don't like to talk about cities because in your own eco so it's much nicer to show a picture of like a beautiful regenerative farm but you know that's not our um reality it can be for some people we should totally encourage that but um yeah it's really opened my eyes just even thinking about it beforehand and reflecting on what i want to get out of it so andrew um going back to solar um you know look, the first question a lot of people ask me is sort of how expensive is it to um get solar panels on your house so what are the different solar solutions for a homeowner and also for someone renting, can they somehow use solar energy even if they don't own their own home? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the <clears throat> one of the key challenges around some of the new technology that's coming around, like electric vehicles and solar power and batteries, is the high upfront capital costs. So obviously, we deliver energy as a service, so we don't charge customers at all for the equipment on people's homes or the battery systems we deploy, or in the future even the EVs that we eventually roll out as a service. And I think that the upfront economics and the, and the requirement to own things is something that is becoming quite old fashioned now. And I think certainly with solar power and electric vehicles, it's going to be much more of a service based model around people using them when they need them. Um, far more economically sort of um, effective from a homeowner's perspective. So I think the upfront capital cost certainly in New Zealand is becoming way less of an issue now. Uh, most people t buy sol or go solar using it as a service with us and then buy systems outright. Um, one of the key challenges around buying systems outright going forwards is going to be around how you how you sort of monetize the battery systems that you need to be able to make that solar effective across day and night. And the challenges with battery storage is that to really um, make them economic, you have to be able to access uh, and deliver services to the, to the national grid, so to transfer here in New Zealand. And to do that, you need to be able to plug those batteries in and trade the energy that you're generating, which is quite advanced, really. And I think what you'll find is that most people um, would rather have those, um, I guess, um, 
challenges around how you interface with the national grid uh, left, left with someone else to manage on it as a service run, try and do it themselves. And I think as a service, effectively, you're able to effectively sort of gather that value far more effectively and to bring forward the economics to make it economic today, which from a climate change perspective is way more important. I think to the second question around, um, I guess, around community energy and people who are renting their own home who can't have access to the same technologies, I think what we'll see here in New Zealand quite quickly now is a shift towards community-based solar power and community-based wind power. You've seen it in North America. It's the fastest growing area, actually, of solar in North America right now is community energy, where you simply, as, a, as, a, as someone who's renting their own, simply subscribe to one, two, or three, or 10 panels on a solar farm. And that allows you to primarily drive your home um, using energy from that farm. And I think that sort of innovation will become quite um, commonplace here in New Zealand in the next one to two years. So I think there is some um, changes coming across which will make solar more ubiquitous than ever here in New Zealand. I see that they're doing that a lot with, um, obviously over in the islands. Um, are you doing anything with them or do you focus solely on New Zealand homes or what? Yeah, we've done some quite a lot of work in Ireland with uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs here um, and with some governments in some of the smaller island states, particularly those that are challenged around challenged with sea level rise, really. So we built one of the largest um, solar power stations in um, Rarotonga, actually, which is right around the airport there, uh, which delivers around a, just over a, what's about a megawatt style, style plant, so a huge power station um, that has more than half the cost of power in, in, in the islands. And I think in those regions in particular where prices power is quite expensive and is, and is generated primarily by diesel, being able to move to community-based power stations can be quite critical to the transition they need to make to a lot towards being becoming a low carbon economy. And the maintenance, obviously, like they're obviously susceptible to um, a huge amount of weather issues. Are they quite durable? The yeah, they're all um, they're all resilient from a wind perspective, which you have to be in the islands because it's pretty windy. Um, mm -hmm. So they're all geared for that sort of. Um, to that, to, to, to sort of withstand that sort of changes, massive changes in weather they experience in the islands. Maintenance with solar panels has never been a big issue, really. I mean, some of the oldest panels are still up and working um, in Japan right now, over 45 years old now. Um, never had a maintenance issue because it's all pretty solid state technology. It's all silicon embedded behind glass, so it's it's there for you know tens of tens of sort of um, years really, without any requirement to go back and fix things. I just had a question coming from a viewer, um, Gabrielle. She's asking, how sustainable are the solar powers produced? You've just mentioned what they're made of. Yeah, it takes, it takes a, I mean, obviously you've got costs involved in terms of energy, in terms of generating and creating the panels in the first place. They pay that embedded energy cost off very quickly indeed, uh, far faster than most people expect within sort of two to five years. Um, and then from that point forward, obviously, it's 100% sustainable in terms of the contribution they make to the economy. And because their lifespan now is expected to be um, you know, well over 45 years, which are some of the oldest panels, that's quite a significant contribution towards decarbonizing the world's economy. And you can recycle them too. I, mean, I, I think I read somewhere that you recycle the batteries in China currently, but you're looking at recycling them here as well? Yeah, we are. So at the moment we're looking at, I mean, recycling lithium ion from electric vehicles and from, um, and from laptops is gonna become an increasingly important part of how you develop a more circular economy here in New Zealand. Uh, and it'll also improve the economics quite quickly. So as we start to embrace more um, electric vehicles here in New Zealand, the ability to take the old batteries out, convert them into stationary batteries for people to use in their homes is gonna be super important if we're not going to create quite a big mess in landfills and in our waterways around New Zealand. So uh, we've just signed a joint venture agreement with Panasonic where we're looking towards establishing a recycling facility here in New Zealand, which will be designed to do exactly that, to upcycle the batteries, to use in homes, and then to upcycle them further to use in UPS systems in data centers around New Zealand. That's fantastic. I mean, Kate, you know a lot about, you work a lot with the circular economy as well. And yeah. Um, Kate, how do you sort of bring your sustainable, because we're talking about home here as well, and you know, sort of circularity in your own home and how you, you live sustainably? Yeah, um, 
Interesting. I think we learned a lot um, when we did the minimalist challenge a few years ago, because that meant um, we literally sorted through our entire homes, home, like what we, like every single thing, every cupboard, it, like nothing, you know, there was no cupboard that we didn't look at. So that really helped us reflect on what are we letting come in? How are we repairing what we have? Um, and it was kind of like um, we got rid, responsibly got rid of um, a thousand things in our home and we're not minimalist and we'll never, never be minimalist. Um, definitely not the vibe, but well, it's probably more spacious than others. But um, now our main idea is when something comes in, you know, that's our responsibility to um, repair it and to care for it and for it to be something that's actually an asset. Um, so we really are quite concerned, considered how whatever comes through that threshold um, has to, that's out, you know, that's quite a big responsibility, even if it's just, um, you know, a piece of clothing or a, a secondhand cushion or something, um, that is a responsibility to then if you end up don't, not using it or if it breaks, um, you have to know how to keep it in, the, in its lifespan um, for as long as possible is our, is our kind of um, values in our home. Uh, so yeah, I think just thinking before you let anything, because it's so easy, I've found and it really opened our eyes after doing that challenge um, about two years ago is that you just get given so much there's so much freebies even on the street that you're handed or um you know people offloading things all the time when you're especially when you're so connected to your community uh and then yeah you can realize how much you can accumulate that can help others so much more um than it can help you so um yeah that whole circular concept is obviously some things have to go um to landfill in terms of um it, I think there was some one thing that was some some type of um, foamy material that we had been given and we thought we could turn it into soundproofing for a music room or something. I remember that was one of the things that I was devastated ended up in the tick because there was nowhere, you know, for it to go. Um, so we try really, really hard to keep things, um, yeah, existing rather than in a hole in the ground. <laughs> um, that's a good ethos to have to um, save money and time and stress and that responsibility, um, even though stuff can bring you joy and, um, you know, allow you to do things like a bike allows you to, you know, enjoy, you know, bike ride or go outdoors, it's still a responsibility. Um, to own that, that is, that is yours, you know, to um, treat, treat well. I was fascinated the other day that um, I went and got my car and I, I did a warrant and my mechanic said to me, oh, your transmission has just gone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I was like, oh, no, how much is that? And they said, oh, it's not worth it, just get a new car. But I was like, oh. you know, like get, get, nice. get a new car. It's like no one's going to buy this car with a transmission thing, so then what? And I was like, yeah. well, no, I'd rather rather have my transmission fixed. Yeah actually have my car oh, it's awesome. just such, it was just such a surplus of things I was saying the other day there is no itch reason to buy anything really in the home when it comes to if you just go to a second hand shop there's so much stuff yeah. and most of it's brand new yeah, yeah. yeah especially, just, especially with cars right because all the cars in New Zealand as everyone knows got a landfill right yeah. every single one mm -hmm. is um, is buried in the ground which is just ridiculous really that you're not able to I mean, some of the electric vehicles coming out of China right now and coming out of Europe and North America are, you know, the, the, uh, pretty much because they've got so few moving parts can go on forever. Mm. So I think you will see a change now. There has been quite a significant change in thinking around certainly electric vehicles in terms of their ability to just um, be, be maintained remotely. Um, and because the lithium mine is the main piece that needs to be upcycled, the ability to just upcycle that. So often today, when you're looking at buying vehicles, electric vehicles in particular, um, it's got to bear in mind, right, that that car's going to be with you for an awfully long time because they literally don't break down in the way that the old fashioned, you know, um, petrol and, and diesel fuel cars did. They don't have that number of moving parts mm -hmm. and the parts they do have are easily replaced. So it's quite a big change. And um, because that I've come across the same approach with vehicles. We had a family car for many years and it broke down and everyone was devastated. And went to the wreckers, but we fought for ages to try and find the pieces for it. But it's just too complicated for many right. mechanics to sort of keep them on the road nowadays. And That's really interesting around electric vehicles that you're saying that they're going to last 
three of us sort of thing. Yeah. And they're not going to break down. So there's still going to be that want, that materialistic, uh, egotistical want to just to to up to get a better car and then to get a better car and to get a better car. It's just it's never been in me. I've not I'm not a car person, but it is in a lot of people, and it's that could be a real problem, couldn't it, going forward? I think it will be. I think I think that's part of the challenge anyway. I think people moving away from this constant drive to consume more and that that more is better is a is quite a fundamental shift in the psychology of most communities because it's been something that's been trained and embedded over lots of I don't know, lots of generations now, driven by advertising largely, and the need to drive a consumer economy. And I think what's something that a lot of people possibly have reflected on over lockdown is how much more money they put in the bank accounts, right? Because they're not, they haven't been on that wheel running around like crazy, you know, and, um, and they can do a lot more with less from a, from a financial perspective. And I think it's important that we don't, you know, coming out of lockdown now over the next period increasingly, that you start to reflect on whether or not you do need to, look, you know, want to continue running your lives in that way. Um, or whether there are the changes that you've experienced and you've made during lockdown as something that could become more sustainable for you as a as a person and for and for the and for the country as a whole. Because if you can make those changes, right, you move away from you move away from um, fossil fuels in terms of car use in New Zealand, and we and you guys probably know we spend the same amount of money on buying fossil fuels and importing it from the Middle East as we do spend and as, as we do earn. Sorry from international tourism every single year. So every dollar we earn from tourism every year, we put on a boat and we send it to the Middle East and pay for fuel. Mm -hmm. Utterly pointless. That is outrageous. Utterly pointless. And (laughs) they've now got communities around New Zealand who are gonna really struggle because tourism is coming to an abrupt halt, right? Right, super fast. So, you know, something that we can all look at um, from my perspective now is to look at how we can accelerate that transition towards electric vehicles um, stop importing all that oil and invest more in our local economies, right? Suddenly you're not spending that amount of money offshore. It's all staying here in New Zealand. It's creating it, a, much more, a much more beneficial circular economy that will sustain multiple generations in the future, right? And make the economy super efficient and fun place to be, really. I think we've all seen from the lockdown what just not driving around in petrol vehicles has, has done oh, for the yeah. environment. You know, it cleared the atmosphere, Pollution yep. levels go down, the birds came out, everything just seemed better. And so I think people are now like, oh, now we can kind of see the benefit of electric vehicles. We can see the benefit of maybe working from home and not commuting as much or t- taking, you know, cycling t- to work, you know. And I certainly got my bike out over lockdown and did a few, you know, but it was lovely because you're on the road and you weren't scared that you were going to get run over by a car, especially in Auckland. Oh, I, was <laughs> so, the same, I was running down the middle of the street. Yeah. And so, suddenly then you, I remember sort of when we moved to one of the other levels and suddenly you're sort of, because you've got your headphones on and and then suddenly you realise there's all these cars coming up behind you now. (laughs) I think people forgot to try how to drive afterwards. Everyone was sort of driving and not indicating and not like... (laughs) So so what does everybody do in their own homes to sort of be sustainable? I mean, I've I've introduced a worm, I've got a worm farm, I've got... I've got a compost at the back, not very good with. Um, haven't nailed the compost thing, um, you know. And I try and recycle and not use as much. Kate, sort of, you've got a, a bit of a system happening at your house. Can you talk us um, through that? I'm a little bit of a compost fan- fanatic. Yes, <laughs> cool. Uh, we have, um, I think, four different types of compost. Sort of, yeah, for our organic matter. So we have a worm farm. Um, we have a dog poo compost. Um, we have a commercial compost pickup and we have a normal compost Um, and we try our best to treat um, recycling as much as like to not just say oh it can be recycled and you know um, have that we try to avoid it as much as possible Um, nearly as much as we try to avoid waste but recycling yeah is Sometimes you have to make those compromises. Um, and we, so when I say we, um, that's me and my husband, uh, my two birds, my dog, and our flatmate and really good friend. Um, so yeah, we have um, the commercial compost pickup is something that some of our friends and family use as well because a home compost is very different to a commercial compost um, in terms of what it can break down in some things. 
um, bench into people's lives that they need to get to a commercial compost and that's not really usually a something that's very accessible in terms of there's no um, drop-off points especially uh, where I live uh, but we are grateful to have we compost come and um, pick it up from our house every week and they take it to their plant which I've uh, been and visited which is really cool the different stages they have and um, yeah that's awesome we have, of, uh, sorry to cut over you there but what's an example of commercial what needs to be commercially composted because I know that sometimes I'll buy maybe a muesli that's in a compostable bag and I know it's probably not going to be that great in my home compost yeah. but I might only have like one muesli bag you know, every six weeks, which wouldn't be enough for a weekly pickup. So what are, what are they picking up a week from your house? <laughs> I don't know. They save all those things. That's actually what a lot of my friends do. They save them all. Uh, they try to avoid them as much as possible. Obviously, they, they save them all and they'll, you know, put it put it in here. So um, if it doesn't say home compostable um, and there's um, specific certifications that usually say that, um, if it just says compostable, um, then highly, highly, highly likely that's only commercial compost. So if it's home home compost certified then that can break down in your compost um, but otherwise yeah that's for a commercial compost which is actually coming more popular some cafes have those collection points um, if they have um, a, a commercial compostable cups and things like that um, ideally it's reused that I personally don't think that's a um, solution but um, it's a really good it's actually for people who live in cities um, it's awesome you can have that you don't have to just put your commercial composting stuff you can put anything in it um, so for people who live in cities that's awesome because once a week they can have all their organ organic waste um, taken and they don't have to have a worm farm balancing on their balcony or you know something around so it's really really cool that um they do that and all of the um soil that's created um goes to orchards and you know replants food so that's a um, great circular system and it's fun having you'll probably know carolyn having a worm farm is really um awesome to just watch the different processes and the different little ecosystem that happens in there um, and dog poo compost is basically a hole in the ground that we put a lid on um, and we put our dog poo in there which we're still trialing it because we've made two so far and it takes a long time to break down so it does depend on your dog's diet and all these different things but um, I know dog poo is often is something that you don't know where you know how to how to get rid of but um, yeah it works then you don't have any hardly any waste at all to to take to the street. <laughs> Oh, sure, that one smells beautiful. <laughs> it's, actually, it's actually not too bad. Interesting enough, it actually turns like the first one we had has turned into a soil that you wouldn't know was dog poo to begin with. But I'm not about to put that on my veggie garden or anything. <laughs> that stays in the ground. Why not? <laughs> well, I personally wouldn't. I think I know. I know someone. I'm not going to name names. <laughs> that actually puts it um their human waste on Christmas trees oh. that they wow that they grow. <laughs> well, as long as we're not eating the Christmas trees, it's okay. Um, I've just yeah, true. one from Brian for you, Kate. Um, mm -hmm. He's asking, what is the most important thing you share with those who aren't conscious about sustainability in the home? I would say, funny we're talking about compost. Uh, um, compost is probably one of the first steps I tell people because um, it can be really hands-on and it can teach you a lot. So it opens your mind and your ideas about how you're eating and where your waste goes. Um, and it just snowballs. I find when people start composting, they start thinking a lot more about other things because it's quite a visual, tangible, tactile um, thing to do. Um, and it can reduce just so much of your waste. Um, yeah, especially if you mainly eat plants. So I think composting is the first thing that I talk to um, and it's also it's also uh, something that people usually know what it is uh, which is really awesome um, that it is so widely known but yeah I just say compost um, and, then, and then I just talk for hours and see see how that goes. <laughs> <laughs> so um, Andrew going back to um, solar now I attended the solar zero launch um, and I was very excited by that. And I just wondered if you would maybe explain to the viewers what that project is and um, and how that's progressing. Because I remember it being this wonderful um, sort of battery unit that you could, it's a pretty good looking um, unit actually that you could either put in your home or just outside your home. Um, can you explain a bit more about the Solo Zero project? Yeah, the project really, uh, which is part of our Grid for Good initiative is designed to allow 
New Zealanders to um, go solar with a with battery storage and energy efficiency in a home um, as a service. So you buy energy from your own roof and you store it and trade energy, as we discussed earlier on. And the great advantage of it and our, mission, our sort of goal really was to create a, as large a sort of um, community of people across New Zealand that could be part of a, a virtual energy community. And we've now, over the last period since we launched it together with you guys, we're now sort of almost 4,000 homes connected up. Um, it's one of the world's largest energy communities now. Uh, wow. We're generating over 18 gigawatt hours of energy every single year. So we, we're powering towns greater than the size of Huntley, sort of as a town right now. Uh, and we're on track to sort of increase that significantly over the next few years. We've, as a consequence, have become quite an important, I guess, partner for some of the bigger um, players in the energy industry in New Zealand, like Transpower. We're um, having detailed conversations with them now about how you can effectively um, work with homeowners across the country to enable homeowners to become an integral part of the national grid. So to help to support and accelerate the nation's transition to becoming 100% renewable. And that was one of the core objectives, if you remember, was to try and explore whether by uh, enabling homeowners in New Zealand to use solar and batteries in the home, we could accelerate the country's transition to become 100% renewable. The government's got a current target of getting there by around 2030, 2035. And what we've realized is that we can get there straight away. So all the people that go solar with us um, enable um, their homes to get to the government's target, of, which is an important climate change reduction target, not in 10 or 15 years time, but straight away. And what we've managed to prove is that by enabling homeowners to embrace energy as a, as a service from their own rooftops locally, buying it locally from their own roofs, you can really enable the government to achieve that, I guess what they, what they talked about as being a, a nuclear free moment for New Zealand, to achieve that super fast which for the next generation of New Zealand is going to be critical, right? Because it'll be the next generation that faces some of the damage that we've wrought on the environment in a way that we can't even imagine today. So it was an important project. Uh, we pulled it off, which is phenomenal. And New Zealand is now home to one of the world's largest virtual energy, uh, uh, energy communities now, which is fantastic. That's incredible. And I, I seem to remember you saying something about using Rangitoto Island as a example of it was to try. It was really to illustrate um, the principle that, that that the country doesn't need to do a great deal to get to 100 percent renewable. I think what we found was that when we looked at the sort of um, the surface area of Rangitoto Island, if we were to put solar panels just in that small area, that would generate enough power every year to power the whole nation and to get the nation to that 100 percent renewable position super fast. So I think from my perspective, it. We wanted to demonstrate that it was easy to achieve economically and we could all do it today. And I think what we've pulled, it, pulled off with over four and a half thousand members now across New Zealand is that you can embrace a new way of generating your own power at home and you can transform the way in which a nation generates power to save money for yourself, the country, and to save the futures of many New Zealanders. Wow, that's inspiring. <laughs> yeah, no, it's pretty cool. So yeah. So what's stopping people? Like, what is the barrier that needs to be broken down to stop people? Because obviously it sounds like, why wouldn't you? I mean, the cost isn't much different, all of those things. What, what's actually stopping people doing this? I think it's, um, I think a lot of it with, with new technology is it's, it's, it's learning to embrace a different way. I think people in their lives on a day-to-day -day basis are so busy with trying to hold things together that quite often it's difficult to look at changing something as significant as to how you power your home. Um, and so what we've been working with all the, uh, our sort of members around the country on is how can you make it super simple? And the objective is still really to work with those members to try and encourage other people to join. In fact, we're launching an initiative next week to try and encourage people from a social network perspective to spread the word really that you're now in a, everyone's now in a position where they can go solar in a way that doesn't cost the earth um, and in a way that really helps many people in the country embrace a way of living which really gives back to, uh, to New Zealand, gives back to communities. Yeah, I think there's a lot of power companies doing that now. I know I got uh, $50 free if I 
tell others and yeah a lot of people doing that now yeah yeah, yeah there's a lot of people looking at how they can I guess how they can encourage people to sort of switch and find a different way and I guess the different difference um, between most other people and us is that we're trying to power the nation in a, in a completely different way that brings power back into the hands of New Zealanders. You've got to remember that, you know, 20 years ago, most New Zealanders were, were paying one cent per kilowatt hour for energy, right? Um, it was a state-owned, you know, operation. It was super cheap, one of the cheapest energy rates in the country. Well, that power rate's gone up by 150%, right? So you've gone from paying one cent to paying, you know, it's in some parts of the country, 35, 36 cents per kilowatt hour for no reason other than to drive the profitability of some of the largest you know, companies now in New Zealand. And now there is a different, cheaper, cleaner way to power your home. Um, we think it's important that most New Zealanders now have that opportunity to, make, to become more efficient, generate their own power locally, and help accelerate the nation's transition to becoming 100% renewable, which I think for all of us who are on, you know, living in, in, uh, here in New Zealand today has to be the most singular most important thing is we all need to achieve in our lifetimes right we have to get the country to that position super fast um and so do other people in other countries but we owe it to our the next generation to do that from my perspective i totally agree i mean my mum put solar panels on her house and it was quite a long time ago and so they were quite expensive and the big ones up on the roof um but you know you're presenting now solar city a fantastic you know affordable easy way to do it and as you say it's why why wouldn't you and it's great that we're able to have this discussion today to let more people know about it and certainly reminding me that I was going to follow up on this and I haven't so I need to yeah look at that I'm I'm going to contact you after Andrew yeah (laughs) sign them up Andrew yeah Yeah. (laughs) difference you're making a difference straight away my god and just oh yeah so inspiring and it's it's the same as composting really and it's the same as it's exactly the same principles, right? Is, is that quite often it's a, it's a way of living that, that, uh, that a lot of people have always aspired to. Everyone aspires to do it, right? And we live in a flat and we compost as well. Um, it's challenging to do it at times and it involves some changes to the way in which you live. But it's about moving, fundamentally, it's about moving away from a, a consumer-driven way of living to one that's more in, in balance, really both balance from a personal perspective in terms of giving yourself time to make those changes and balance from an environmental perspective. And I think it's, um, it's really about um, looking at life quite differently. And I think solar, you know, I think from everyone's perspective, as I mentioned, from chief exec of Shell Energy, who played a big role, right, in destroying the planet, who believes that solar is absolutely going to become the number one energy source in the world. I think we should all probably take a leaf out of this book and Look at how we can embrace composting and new technologies and upcycling of battery technologies and you know zero waste at home, which is I'm a big proponent of, right? Which is how you can um, you know buy your own materials from the ground up and and make your own foods from the ground up. It's a, a much more enjoyable way to live. It takes more time, but it's a more enjoyable and more nourishing way to spend your time. I find. Yeah, right. I totally agree. And I've got a couple more questions that have come through. Um, Kirsty is asking, can uh, individual apartments be fitted with solar panels? Individual apartments, not really, because you've got body corporates um, which govern how common spaces and, and lots of things are governed. But there is a, um, a number of initiatives underway right now to solarise apartment blocks as a whole to create energy for common areas and for individual flats. And I think that will become uh, ubiquitous across many rooftops now as the price of the technology starts to decline even further. You're essentially on a quite a steep trajectory of of, um, downward costs in terms of technology, which means that you're able to deliver energy at a a much lower levelized cost now into apartment blocks and into industrial scale buildings. So I think the transformation you're gonna see across across um, life, well, across um, uh, city, city sort of cityscapes in particular, will be quite dramatic and will allow everyone from people who own, own or rent flats to people that live on lifestyle blocks to embrace a different way of powering their home. And there's another question uh, for you, Andrew, from uh, Karishma, asking, as many people in New Zealand rent homes, is there an incentive for landlords to install solar panels? Yeah, we provide incentives um, to landlords to try and encourage them to 
embrace dollar for, for, um, for people who rent their homes because obviously it allows you to look in a um, certainty in a much lower price for energy today. Um, and I think the key thing is to introduce um, the idea to your landlord and talk to them in the same way that landlords are required to insulate homes properly now in the UK and New Zealand. I think it should be, um, yeah, I think we should encourage as many landlords as possible to equip their homes with the latest technology. It allows um, homes to be kept much warmer at a more affordable price. And I think that's a great thing for, for families living in rented accommodation. That's great. Um, talking to, it's funny, we're kind of bouncing between in the home and outside the home and en energising the home. Um, Kate, I noticed behind you, you've got some interesting, you've upcycled some home, some knobs. Are they door handles or what are they behind you? Um, they're door handles that I collected from a few different parts. One of them is from like a dairy farm I worked on for a week doing something random and a few are from different parts just different part, pieces of life um that I put on it was an old piece of wood I found at my parents house and it's just hanging some different bouquets of flowers I've been given over the years um so yeah I think everything in our house is um yeah looking at everything actually it's all second hand or um, has been passed down recently inherited my great grandmother's um little stool yeah, so I, there is no need to buy new um, furniture, in my opinion, in terms of what's already there. And I personally think um, maybe it's just because of my taste and my love of rustic and, and vintage things. But I think they look much nicer, too. Um, and they look unique and, you know, you can create a home that is much more cosy and um, creative and inspires more more ideas. And because, you know, a better mental state of mind when you have things around you that have story. Yeah, so yeah, don't don't go inviting Kate round to your house because she'll just steal your doorknobs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, true. No, I've stopped. I've stopped. <laughs> that she was... comes with a screwdriver. Just worry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's a few people who probably haven't invited me back actually. Yeah. <laughs> like, where did that handle go? Yeah, so yeah. I did notice though you've got one kind of newish thing in your home though, which mm -hmm. I did notice on your blog called the lumber desk, which you're is... currently sitting on it, Carolyn. <laughs> You are? You're, you are. You're currently <laughs> on the desk. Oh, I'm on the desk. Okay, right. I've got you now. Explain to me what it is because I saw a picture of it and you were kneeling. Yes. And so, how does it work, you know? Yeah, so um, this has been, so I have worked from home for nearly three years um, and I just had, I think it was my husband's old desk from when he was a kid and a little laptop and I kind of slowly upgraded to a secondhand screen and then this desk which has been such cool work investment um, it's a dynamic desk so often you hear it of a standing desk and right now I'm standing um, but the whole idea is created by um, a physio who was just frustrated at um, fixing people's problems from work related injuries and we all mo like a lot of us sit at a desk you know all day um and that is so frustrating to watch the same injuries come in because of the same you know workplace issues so he stopped that and he created this so you can sit at all different heights um it's made that there's weights in it so there's no it's not mechanical and it can literally sit at any type of height um i often kneel on um the stool um and it is so comfortable, it makes your back really straight. Um, so I'll kneel and I'll stand. I don't have a chair in my office, um, but you could, or some days I could you know, bring one in or a stool or anything. Um, and it means your body's just constantly moving, um, which is really good for doing anything, you know, like nothing good comes from sitting in one place at a time. It's not sustainable in the long run for your body. Um, and it's not actually gonna help you finish that piece of work because you, you know, your body needs to be you know, aligned with to be able to actually give proper output. Um, so yeah, it's really awesome. He's worked with um, some, the fabric that goes around the weights, which control this, uh, um, a local group outside of Wellington who do some awesome work and it's made from um, as much sustainable materials as possible. And every single piece can be, um, unlike the car, <laughs> um, can be replaced and repaired. Um, so yeah, it's, Change, change things up and everyone gets jealous when they see it so <laughs> say sitting's a new smoking and we do spend a lot of time sitting down and I just went to the chiropractor earlier today because I spent you know a lot of time sitting recently and everything was kind of locked up so yeah That's yeah moving around is definitely better 
yeah it's not good like people have standing desks and they just stand all day which also isn't good so it's quite cool that you can kneel and you can kneel in different spots um you know and like while we've been talking I mean I can stretch my stretch my hamstrings or you know like it's yeah it's really cool <laughs> so you you I see on your website that you've got a whole bunch you obviously endorse a bunch of products mm -hmm. um Kate so how do you do, do you obviously do a lot of research around your products and and yeah, what's the vigorous yeah. how do they get you do? Yeah, how yeah, do yeah. they get on your site and um it depends obviously on the product because each one you know we have different things um I spend a lot of time talking to the um, founder usually straight to the source um I spend several weeks trialing a product um beforehand and I have different ways because obviously I may not need it but I need, may need to trial it so I have different ways of not just having heaps of stuff in my life that I um, give it to others too um, but I just ask a lot of questions around um, the circularity of it so where it will go when it's broken um, will you know did that company take responsibility for the packaging or do they take responsibility for repairs um, who made it so all of the different hands from seed to garment when you're talking about clothes or from you know all different manufacturing points um, how are the people treated how are they paid um, you know what is all, all, all those sorts of questions um, so brands kind of if they turn off at the start then see you later <laughs> um, or if they come back to me with a very generic um, email which seems like some brands have the same copy that they send out when you ask um, then that's not okay too but um, a lot of brands will come back and be transparent around um, what things aren't perfect and that they're trying in terms of the limber desk the wheels there's wheels on it um, so those wheels are made of plastic and they're still trying in terms of to be able to get something that may be more sustainable but um, for them that was a something they had to you know include and um they're still working on that so rather than them saying oh yes Kate it's amazing it's 100 sustainable there's nothing like this is the most perfect product um I work with brands who are upfront about how they could because I believe you can always improve there is no brand who's the most sustainable always you can improve with your ethics and your sustainability so um yeah I think it's just a matter I become very very close and upfront and personal uh, which means I usually become best friends with the brand and we <laughs> invite each other to our birthday parties um which is yeah a result of how um kind of yeah deeply I know people um are sick of being greenwashed and are sick of buying products and they feel like they've done the right thing and then hearing that they haven't um I don't think consumers deserve that um so yeah that's that's how I do it so what's um in regards to greenwashing and everything are you seeing we obviously see it at good magazine it's like we've turned away quite a few businesses that have um, tried to greenwash products or whatever and it's just I feel like it's our responsibility to make sure that our what we're putting in the publication is um, you know like you say no one's perfect and um, we're not perfect we're, we're, we've got a way to go as well but we try our hardest to get what we can actually do yep. for to be sustainable but yeah it must be hard I, I see on your feeds that come through um around not being having to be perfect and as a someone that's sort of a game changer in this field and and becoming more popular in this are you finding that people pick you up on on certain things and troll you or like how's <laughs> yeah I I surprisingly probably not as much as people would ex expect but then again I'm also very upfront about my failures and about the fact that so I think people know that the second they say oh you did this I'm like yeah I did because I'm human I'm living in society not in a tiny home out on a farm you know so I think um, people know that I'm I've probably already said all of the bad things or you know all the things that I don't do or the things that I'm not Good enough um and so um yeah i think for some people it's really hard especially and i do understand this because there's some topics that become so so deeply ingrained in you that when you see people going against that um for me it's often fashion in terms of who make you made your clothes when you see people not acing that perfectly it can be um you can immediately want to rage and have an outrage because it's just so so close to your deep values and beliefs um, but I think I constantly have to remind myself that 
uh, five years ago, I stood in Westfield Mall and could happily walk around there and not have any of those feelings. So it's just having understanding for the fact we all have different things that we, um, all different values um, and some may be more important to others and that is totally, totally okay. So it's all, all a journey. So yeah, there definitely are people who poke and prod and I probably um, think I'm stronger than I actually am in terms of when that stuff comes in. But um, the people who benefit from my work are the people I exist to, you know, serve and educate. So um, they're what I focus on, not the not the others. <laughs> I think like because I work with people with meditation and try and raise their vibration um, as much as they can <laughs> and personal development and things like that. And I think the more you start to care and the more you become conscious of things, you start to, when you do do something that's not in alignment with the earth or whatever, you start to really feel it. Mm -hmm. And I think that to me is like, if we can just raise our vibe enough to actually start caring enough totally. um, sure. for yeah. what we're doing and not just going and buying that coffee and yep. having a plastic lid on it and, you know, yep. but where does that go? You know, it's, the care you have to the more you know you can't unknow it right so it is raising that level of of care because there's a lot of things now just like I just wouldn't do it like you go to a cafe and they say oh sorry we don't have a cup I'm like don't like I don't need a coffee like it's not you know like I would never in a million years um not even take a compostable one so it's like and the more you know and the more um that just becomes like of course I brush my teeth in the morning and at night like of course, you know, that's something that is, I've been taught, you know, when I was younger. So I think the more, yeah, the more you know and care and you know the impact of it and the fact, you know, people say, if I'm just one person, it doesn't matter about my sustainable home habits. Um, it does because all of these little one people have created the problem. So we can create, you know, <laughs> the solution. So kind of yeah, we need to start thinking more about we instead of I. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think it's great in this modern time, you know, more and more of us can shop with our, with our ethics and, um, and talk about ethics. I was also thinking about aesthetics as well. Um, Andrew, I wanted to ask you about good looking solar panels. I mean, are there, are there any great, great examples out there in architecture where people have kind of created really cool things with solar and integrated that into their design? Yeah, I mean, I think there's, some, there's a, a tower in, uh, in the UK called the CIS Tower, actually, which is um, the entire facade of the, of the building is, is covered in a glass structure which is uh, laminated with solar panels, which in, looks incredible. So and as I said earlier, the flexible use of super thin silicon now will become every day. So I think that it really is just a, um, about what you can imagine in terms of how you can use this technology now to integrate into new buildings or into existing buildings. So it really is just, I think, from a, from a design and aesthetic perspective, it really is. There is no limit to it from a, from that perspective. I think the key or always will be trying to come up with a way of using the technology which is repeatable, right? So that the more you make it bespoke, the harder it becomes to upcycle and recycle. So I think it is important to look at design in terms of how you can reuse the technologies that you're deploying. So I think in many respects, although you can do lots of imaginative things with different shapes, I think the traditional panels and how they sit on roofs are probably the technology that will become more most seen around the country. And because they're able to create those in quite ultra thin panels now, um, they do look super good now on roofs now, you know, and they are a real badge of um, your commitment to change. Um, and I think you need to look at them in that way, right? They're not something that you should see as something ugly on the roof, but it's a real badge of honor from my perspective. Very, very good point. And I've got, we've got time for one more question that's come in, um, or maybe two, I'm getting, I'm getting two. <laughs> uh, two questions have come in. Um, can you still use solar energy during a power cut? Yeah, with, um, interestingly, um, with the battery um, system that we deploy, um, as soon as you have a power cut, um, essentially the system switches over. It's called islanding, and it allows you to use and continue living in your home and using all your key appliances in exactly the same way. And we see that around country. I think there are about 600,000 New Zealanders every year that, um, that have to sort of experience power cuts. It's becoming increasingly frequent now as the grid gets older, right? So it's over, you know, many parts of the grid are many years old now. So um, having, and being able to access that sort of technology that kicks in 
when the power goes out is important, especially as the climate becomes more erratic, being able to sustain and live through some of those dramatic changes is, is going to become super important for communities around the country. That's fantastic. Well, I can't believe our hour is pretty much no, come, no. To, come to an end. Like we, could, we could talk all day. Such an interesting topic and yeah, um, yeah. just so incredibly inspiring. Um, and so, yeah, I've just been, and while I've been here, I've been sipping away at this gorgeous Pinot Noir from Connor Wine. So um, thanks for that. And for those of you watching, uh, if you want to be in to win um, with Kono Wines restaurant voucher or to get one of four $100 Wallace Cotton vouchers, go to Good Magazine or Good, sorry, good.net.nz slash competitions and be in to win with that. Um, I just want to thank you so much, Andrew, for your time and Kate and Justine. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure. And um, thanks for joining us for Thank Good It's Friday and cheers. Yeah. Great way to spend a Friday. <laughs>